Good evening. It is so lovely to see you all. Welcome. It is 6.45. Well, it's actually 6.46. That's not my fault, though. That's Dua Lipa. She ran a little long. I told her to cut it, do the short version of the song, and she just continued right to the end. So I'm uh, really excited to, uh, to be with you here this evening. For those of you who uh, do not know me, my name is Rick Scott. Uh, I am the operating partner and principal broker for the Keller Williams Realty offices in uh, Ridgefield, Stamford, Westport, Danbury, and Newtown. Uh, I've been a real estate licensee for going on 23 years, which makes me sound way older than I look. And yet, that is accurate, 23 years, my goodness. Uh, and the good news is that I'm also a, uh, a full-time real estate investor. So that's good news since that's the topic of our, uh, of our time together uh, tonight. I am excited to, we'll, we'll probably spend the next you know, three or four hours or so kind of really doing a deep dive into, no, 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 I'm kidding. But it was worth it to see the faces of the people who thought, oh, what did I sign up for? Three to four hours, is this guy kidding me? No, but for real, so you have, uh, you have an opportunity to kind of plan your evening. We will probably spend about an hour to an hour and 10 or maybe 15 minutes or so together. Um, longer if you have questions, uh, we wanna make sure that we get a Q and A in at the end and allow you to ask any questions that you have along the way, uh, but also give you the content that you, uh, that you are expecting. So, uh, so hang in there. I know, you know Zoom can sometimes be tough, especially after a long day, but um, put the kids to bed. I know it's a little early, but you know what? Put them in front of the TV little adult beverage and we'll do fine. So I know that for most of you, the last two years of, you know, bizarro world have gotten you really attuned to Zoom. However, I do want to just run through a quick couple of Zoom rules before we, uh, before we get started. So I do have the all powerful mute all button. Uh, and so uh, I will keep you muted uh, just because there's a lot of us here is 70 plus and growing. Uh, so I'm gonna keep everybody muted. However, that doesn't mean that I don't encourage questions. I want this to be as interactive as you desire it to be and for you to ask as many questions as, uh, as you choose. And so uh, here's how you'll do that. For those of you who are, who are uh, Zoom um, aficionados, you know that there's a little hand, right? So you can always raise your Zoom hand. Uh, or you can go ahead and uh, put the question you have in the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat box as well. So we'll get to those questions as they come up. Or if neither one of those things work or you can't figure that part out, go ahead and unmute yourself. Just unmute yourself and kind of stay not talking. I will see that you will have unmuted. And as soon as I finish my thought, I will then call on you to, uh, to ask your question. For those of you who uh, are on as you know iPhone 7 or mom's iPad, it'd be awesome if you could change that to your actual name so that if you have a question, uh, I can call on you by name and we can just have a conversation. Uh, for those of you who don't know how to do that, in your little Brady Bunch square that you're in, in the upper right-hand corner, there are three dots. And if you click the three dots, you can rename uh, your, your, your thing there. Here, I'll demonstrate because I forgot to do my own because my name is not KW Zoom Room. There we go, see, voila. You didn't know you get a Zoom class as well, right? It's two for the price of one. All right, so uh, anybody have any questions on the whole Zoom protocol? Like normally when we're in person, uh, we have a conversation about you know, phones and we have a conversation about eating food and drink and where the bathrooms are, however, uh, most of you are in your living room, so if you don't know where the bathrooms are, I cannot help you, right? That is something we're going to have to address perhaps after the fact. Um, so sit back and let me give you a little bit of a, of a quick background on me to get us started so you know kind of who you're talking to and um, uh, what my level of experience is so that we can then dive into, uh, into our content together. Uh, I bought my very first investment property um, really kind of by accident uh, almost 20 years ago back in 2003 I had sold a house that I had improved and I sold it at a uh, at a profit made some money on it and so I took some of those profits 
and I bought a condo cash for investment. And then I got really busy uh, with my business partner, Debbie Orr, who I think is on the call. There she is. Wave, Debbie, so everyone can see you. There she is. How spectacular. And by the way, if you don't have your cameras on, uh, I think you're gorgeous. So I think we should all actually be on camera. For those of you who are hiding behind your cameras, um, go ahead and let the world see you. Why not? Uh, so, so Debbie and I really got kind of busy on launching real estate offices in, in Fairfield County. And that kind of took me away from the real estate investing side of things for about 10 years, right? In 2013, uh, my oldest child, my son, uh, turned 15, uh, going on 16. And all of a sudden, we kind of looked up and realized that we had not done a very good job of saving for college, right? Anybody ever been there? For those of you who have smaller kids, I encourage you not to not to follow that path, right? Start making some changes right now so you don't get to that point and, and realize that you haven't done what you need to do to be prepared for that. And so, so what I was looking for suddenly was a way to take what money I did have and find a vehicle that could that could turn that money into more money that I could then use in the short term to make more money and in the long term to pay for college. Right. And so that's kind of what pushed me back into the arena um, to uh, to make sure that uh, that I was able to provide for my for my kids. And for me, that vehicle was real estate. Uh, I, I, I decided at that moment to become a buy and hold investor. We'll talk about the different types of investing a little bit uh, a little bit later. I was interested mostly in cash flow. Right. I wanted I wanted the, my main purpose for being that investor was to buy a property to throw off a certain amount of money each month so that I could take that money and pay for college. So that was the plan. Right. And over time, what was interesting is that that plan kind of took on a life of its own. And so over the past nine years, uh, that plan has grown into its own standalone business. I now own 24 properties plus the house I live in uh, for a total of 70 rental units. My gross rent roll is about 63 or so thousand dollars a month, uh, which after I pay all the expenses and pay the mortgages, uh, that kind of nets me anywhere, depending on the month, anywhere from 18 to 21 or $22,000 uh, a month. So conservatively, it's about an extra $200,000 a year. And I, I don't say that lightly when I say the word extra, right? But I, but I, I say it purposefully because I, I want you to, to, to recognize that I, like I have two full-time jobs, right? Running these real estate companies, as, as many of you who are, uh, who are agents inside of our, our offices know, it is its own full-time job, right? And so or maybe a full-time and, and a half job. And so what I've had to figure out over time is how to have a thriving business over here and not really participate in it much anymore. And we'll talk about management of, of your assets a little bit later on, because there are two ways to do it. I've done both ways. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, I'll help you understand kind of what those, uh, what those options are. So I don't, I don't take an extra $200,000 a year uh, lightly. Now, to be clear, I, I may not be the, the biggest investor um, that you'll ever meet. I may not be the smartest investor that you'll ever meet. I may not even be the biggest or smartest investor on this call tonight. However, the value I think I bring to the table uh, is that everything that I have, I built from zero. I built from scratch, right? I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I, I did not, some, no one died and left me lots of money or, or an apartment building. Um, you know, I, I, I started with, with relatively little and over time just made good decisions and built and built and built and reinvested and reinvested to kind of move to the place where I am today, which, which I'm proud of. Now, I have a couple of disclaimers. Disclaimer number one, I am not a financial advisor. Number two, I am not an attorney. Number three, I am not a wealth manager. So what I am is a real estate broker who just decided to make some choices to invest in what he knew. 
And that just started to grow with some additional decisions each month and each year that's now turned into this, into this standalone business that's, that's becoming a, a bit of a, of a cash machine, right? But so I don't, want you, I don't want you to hear the things that I'm saying to you today and take them as, uh, as the only way to do it or as gospel in any way, right? This is what I'm sharing with you tonight as transparently as, as, uh, as I can and as transparently as you want or need me to is just what my experience has been right? So if you go in and do it and it doesn't work, don't come back and say, well, you said this would work because I am recording this. So I have proof that what I said was, this was my experience. I think that this path can work for anybody. And yet life happens sometimes, right? We're going to talk about the life happens portion of this as well. Like where, where, where are the risks? What, what, what about the what if that's in the back of, of a lot of your heads, right? We'll get, we're going to get to that. Now, if you remember, my goal started out as a means to, for doing this to, to pay for college, right? Which, by the way, I did pay for college. And then as that kind of progressed, my goal was to own 20 properties that cash flowed at least $1,000 net a month to me by the time I was 50. Last June, I closed on my 20th property three months after my 51st birthday. So I was a little, it took me a little bit longer than I had planned. And now the, the, the goal is reset, right? And so now the goal is double that number. So now I'm pushing to 40 properties by the time I'm 55. I will turn 52 in three weeks. I'll put the date in the chat a little later if you wanna send a card or a note or just give me a call on that day. I always appreciate that. So the the uh, the idea is now five more properties a year for the next three years so I can hit that 40 by the time I'm 55. Now, that is aggressive, five in a year, every year for the next three years. But I, I say it to you for this reason. I want you to consider what I am creating. 40 properties at $1,000 a month net to me is $40,000 a month, right? And And knowing that not everything always goes the way that you want it to go and, you know, pandemics happen and, you know, things go wrong and life shows up. Conservatively, that still turns into about three to $400,000 a year, right? If you do the math, it's three to $400,000 a year. And I don't know about you, but that starts to look like income replacement and financial freedom to me. And so, so that's, that's why, you know, college is almost done. My youngest now is, is almost done. That money is set aside. I don't need these properties for college anymore. And what's cool is that besides continuing to set financial goals and targets, the whole, the whole business itself has started to shift from making money to creating a retirement opportunity and then legacy, like what am I now creating for my children so that when I am not here anymore, what, what, what will they inherit, right? Is this a vehicle that now pays for my grandkids and my great grandkids college and their first houses and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's kind of cool how it, how it starts one place and morphs into something completely different. All right, so. That's kind of my background. Um, that's that's what you get for the next hour or so. I, I hope I hope I hope you weren't expecting something completely different, because it'll, be, it'll be a long hour if you were expecting something completely different. If you're okay with what I just gave you, well then we'll have some fun in the next 59 minutes or so. Um, I will put this on the screen right now. Please note, I am not a big PowerPoint guy to the extent that. Here is the extent of the PowerPoint that you will get this evening. See, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to turn it on. There we go. All right. Nope. Well, that's not it. All right. We'll just go here because now I'm. Oh, here we are. There we go. The extent of my PowerPoint cover slide and then the agenda. So here's, here's what we're going to cover tonight so that you have uh, some clarity around what that looks like. We're gonna talk about money and financing. 
I find that one of the one of the biggest questions that people have about taking that first step is how do I pay for it, right? And the good news is uh, we have a guest with us tonight who I will introduce momentarily, who is uh, who is my path to uh, all things money and financing when it comes to uh, my investment properties, and her name is Karen Mulreed. And we're going to hear from her in just a moment on the whole money and financing opportunity. Uh, we'll talk about the criteria to purchase. We'll talk about management of the asset. We'll talk about, I'll, I'll walk you through the spreadsheet that I use that, that if you want a copy of, we're happy to make that available to you. Just, just whoever invited you here tonight, ask them for a copy of it and they'll make sure that we, uh, that we get that to you. It's a simple spreadsheet, but it really does the job of kind of vetting the property so you understand what the expected cash flow is uh, each and every month and year. Um, and of course, Q and A. And again, I don't want just because Q and A is at the bottom of this agenda doesn't mean that we're going to wait till the end for questions. If you have questions, don't hesitate to uh, to stop me and ask them as we go. All righty, how are we doing so far? You still with me? Okay, excellent. So, if it's all right with you, what I'd like to do is start with money and financing. Um, again, I find that one of the one of the biggest opportunities we have uh, is to recognize that there are more ways to start and pay for uh, your first investment property or your second investment property or your third, depending on where you're at. Right? There, there are more ways today than uh, than I think many people um, recognize. And to walk us through many of them, where is she, my dear friend, the lovely and talented? Ms. I'm going to bring me into this as well. There we go. Um, I'm here. Karen Mulreed. How are you, Karen? Good. How are you? So nice to be here tonight with so many people. Uh, indeed, we have a lot of investors. Indeed. So do me a favor. Introduce, introduce yourself. Tell us, tell us who you are, what you do, what you own, and uh, how long you've been doing it. And then take us into uh, your thoughts about financing these investment properties. Okay. I'm Karen Mulreed. I'm, my company is Westport Mortgage. I am in the business. It will be 25 years on Monday, Valentine's Day. So be sure to wish me a happy anniversary. I'm very excited about that. And I have been um, helping realtors sell and helping buyers buy for the last 25 years. As a broker, we have lots and lots of um, products and lenders that we work with, about 25 different lenders, and they all have some niche products. And I have to tell you, the investor, um, the investor product line is one that is coming on strong. Um, you know, prior to just when COVID started, it was somewhat limited as everything was. And over the last year, it has grown. And I have some very exciting products to tell you about tonight. So I'm very excited. Brilliant to be here. Brilliant, brilliant. So where do you want to start? Uh, you, you want to kind of give us an, an overview and then kind of have people ask questions as, as you're going through, because I'm certain that people will have some questions. Why, but why don't you kind of give us an overview of some of the things that you have available, ideas that you've heard, uh, things you know that, that I've done. Share with us um, an overview okay. of finances. One of the first ways I tell um, anyone who's interested in investing is to start with maybe a multifamily. We have an FHA uh, um, loan product, a 30-year fixed, which allows you to put three and a half percent down on a one to four family. It's a great way to get your feet wet, so to say, to actually own your own property and also um, live and help maintain the property that you're investing in. It, FHA allows for three and a half percent down and it's very flexible as far as credit, reserves, and, um, and income. So it's a great way to get your feet wet. It's also probably one of the cheapest ways to pay for your mortgage because you will pay the, the, um, the principal and interest on your mortgage and you'll have the other two to three units um, that you're buying help pay the mortgage as well. So I love that option for, for especially for first time home buyers. We also have conventional loans. Again, every time you document your income, 
it's the least expensive way to own and finance and pay for your investment property. It's certainly not the only way, but it is the least expensive. So conventional loans, um, you know, your basic 15 or 30 year fixed, I always encourage a 30 year fixed on um, these types of loans because I think it, it keeps your payment as low as possible and allows you for the greatest cash flow. If you wanna pay these off, you are welcome to do so anytime you like. So with the conventional loans, FHA loans, there's no prepay. Um, and then I have some um, renovation loans that you can do on investment property. So if you find a property that needs a little um, tender loving care, you can, before you, you know, rent it out, you are welcome to take advantage of the renovation loans that are available. Again, they're 30 year fixed rate loans. They allow you the money to purchase and to rehab. It's a, it, they're really fabulous loans and not everyone um, knows that they're available. So Karen, those are your about, base, go ahead. What about down payments? Uh, so talk about down payment. I mean, so if, if, we're, if they're headed into a condo purchase or a multifamily purchase, what are the down payments that are required in those loan programs for those kinds of purchases? And do you have thoughts or ideas about how to obtain some of those, uh, some of those down payments? Because again, that, that's a, what I find when I talk to brand new investors are like, yeah, I get it, but how much do I have to have to get into it? So, so can you spend a little time on that? Sure. On single family loan, single family or condos, fifteen percent down is all you need, and that's a you know a pretty great, um, a pretty great deal. And I always um, encourage people to take a look at their finances and never put yourself in what I call harm's way. You want to make sure that you are financially um, ready to take on the additional um, responsibility. So make sure that your, you know, your own personal debt is as low as possible so that you know you have the cash flow because you are going to be a homeowner you know, on a, uh, on a multifamily. So you want to make sure that you have some cash flow to work with. So you can put as little as 15% down, you can put 20% down um, on two to four units, you can put, you, you must put 25% down. Got so it. those are, and, and you know, I, I encourage people borrow from your 401k unless you know you need it in the next year or two. Um, you can take margin loans against your investments. You can sell items that you are, you know, you don't need. I've had people sell cars or motorcycles or boats or things that they didn't want anymore because, they wanted to become investors. I'll tell you, one of the things that that um, that I did was I took money out of the, the when I sold my, the house that I made the money on, I bought a new house and someone said, OK, well, wh why did you put so much down on that house? Why, why, why aren't you using some of that equity to go buy an investment property? I thought, oh, I, I don't know. I thought I thought the right thing to do was to you know, have my mortgage be as low as possible. Uh, except from a financial perspective, that was kind of a dumb decision, right? I, it was it was just dead money sitting in my house. And so I just borrowed out of the house to buy that first investment property. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I and you, you and I have had this conversation many times. If you own your home and you have equity in your home and can take cash out to invest on other properties, it is the least expensive way to take on down payment. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And today, everybody's home is worth so much more than it was even a couple of years ago that there, you can tap right into that equity and take advantage. Yeah. And so, so would, would you agree that sometimes people who, who have equity in their homes and they're like paying down that mortgage and they're throwing extra money at it, right, to get it gone, do you agree that they can sometimes be a little stubborn about... Um, are you speaking from experience? <laughs> well, well, sure. And I, I'm happy to have you use me as an example. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think that, you know, I, I think it's great that people want to pay down their mortgages or pay down any type of debt that they have and live debt free. The only issue with that is that you have all the money tied up in an asset that you can't take, you know, I say a brick out of your, your home, bring it to anywhere and actually buy anything with it you have to take the cash out of your home. And with rates still being as low, even though I know we're all hearing rates are, you know, up a little bit from where they were a couple of months ago, it's still the least expensive way. So to increase your, um, your cash flow, take the money out of your house, use that for down payment, 
And now you have somebody else who'll be paying that mortgage because you'll have to be having renters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so I'll tell you personally that, that Karen hounded me for two years. It's like, you know, you, you keep buying properties, you keep, well, minimally two years, she, she might tell you four years, but I, I, I had a bunch of equity in my house. Right. And she kept, so we finally got to a point where um, I, I caved and I have to tell you, she was so right. I, I I took an extra three hundred thousand dollars out of my house, which I can I can turn into five or so down payments for investment properties that I buy at two point seven five percent. I mean, you, you cannot get cheaper money than uh, than that. So thank you for pushing me because you you are a hundred percent right, and and that's now turned into more opportunity for me to continue to grow. Yeah, and ju- and just remember, just because you take the money out of your house doesn't mean you owe any more money, you owe the same amount of money, whether you take it out of your house or you um, you take larger mortgages you know, out on the investment property. There's still properties that you own, you're still financially responsible for them. You know, whether they're in LLCs or whether you have them in your own name. Got it, got it. So, so don't be so afraid of that. So question in the chat. So if you are looking to buy a multifamily, like a two family or a three family that, that's going to be owner occupied, is it three and a half percent with FHA or do you have to have the 25%? No, it's three and a half percent with FHA. As long as it's owner occupied. As long as it's owner occupied. It's, I mean, it's a great, I think it's, you know, one of the biggest finds that we have, you know, in our business that you can, you know, buy a four unit for three and a half percent down. Crazy. And in Fairfield County, the, the um, loan amounts are larger than they are in other parts of the state, but it, they've all gone up recently. So we're at like 697 in Fairfield County for just a single family is the, is the max. Cool. So um, it, it's pretty high. So I think, that, um, I think that Moses had a question. And if there are any other questions about financing, uh, Karen is uh, more than happy to take those. Moses, did you still have your question? Uh, yes. So when, when you, uh, Karen, when you mentioned 15%, uh, is that for, a, a person who already owns a home wants to go ahead and invest and buy two family or multifamily homes. 15% is one of the products you guys have? Or yes, it it's for a conventional loan. Oh, it's a conventional loan, okay. Yes, you have to document your income and your savings. I, I do have three other products that I, I know were, um, that I wanna make sure I tell you about just so that you're aware of them. Anybody who has questions or wants to contact me after um, is, is you're welcome to, but I do have three products that you should know about. Um, one is a, um, a no income verification investor loan. You do not document your personal income. They use the cash flow of the property to qualify that financing. You know, it's great for anybody who's starting out. I have some lenders who will um, will lend to someone who ha- doesn't even have a home, you know, who's living with their parents. Um, and then others who require that you have owned a home, but there is that available to you and you do not verify income. You verify your down payment, you verify reserves because they wanna know that you have some money afterwards, but you don't verify income, there are no tax returns. I have another product, it's a fix and flip. So if you buy something, you don't want to document your income, you can buy it, fix it up, and then either sell it or you have to refinance out of it. This is not a loan that you're going to keep forever. It's just you know, something to help you get the renovation funds. And then the last one I want to make sure you hear about is a construction loan for, um, for investment properties. Again, you're not documenting your income. There are some, uh, of course, guidelines. You, you need a little bit more money down. I think it's 30% down. These are business types of loans, but they are available and you do not have to document your income to get them. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, lots of lots it's of opportunity. Um, really awesome. John, go ahead and ask your question. Um, hi, Karen. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. My question is for the the no income qualifying loans, um, is there like a credit score um, minimum that you have to meet? And um, what are the rates typically looking like for those? Um, actually, they, they're all a little bit different. 620 is the lowest that I've seen. You could be up in the, in the um, mid fives to 6% on some of those. 
Um, of course, the fix and flip because you're getting construction money could be seven or eight percent, and the construction can be anywhere from seven to nine. But remember, these are not loans that you're keeping for 30 years. Um, the fix and flip and the construction loan, they're interest only while you're taking draws. And then, um, you know, you, you know, you have the, the balance that you're, you know, you're going to sell that, you know, you're going to sell the construction probably, unless you decide to live in it. But most of the time you're selling and the fix and flip, you're, you're, you're fixing it up so that you can rent it to someone else or sell it. And to follow up really quickly, sorry, um, for the no income qualifying loans, is there anyone for like a buy and hold investment by any chance? There's only it's, yes, flips. yes, yeah. absolutely. You can buy, you know, one to four family and buy and hold those. There are some that are um, five to to eight units, or they have a, a blanket mortgage for up to 20 doors. If, if you, you know, have a particular situation that you want to talk about, I can answer, you know, I can find out more for your specific situation. There, I'm, I'm talking in general terms because there's so many different caveats depending upon your particular situation and the type of property that you're looking for. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, John. Matt, you're muted, my friend. We're fixing that. Um, Karen, on the buy and hold for the no income verification, what is the down payment? Does that differ from the other program? 20 to 25%. Are there any other fees associated after the points or anything? Um, yeah, there are always some points on those, definitely. Okay. You know, these are all business, you know, they're all business loans. They're not your basic residential conventional mm -hmm. loans. If you document your income, of course, then you're not paying those extras. Right. But, you know, for the for that privilege, and it's great. I mean, I have some clients who can document. They just don't want to. They don't want to take all those tax returns and, um, you know, and deal with that. And they just, you know, do it without verifying their income. Okay. I've done Thank a you. ton of them. And they're very quick by the way, as well. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Carolyn, Carolyn go, go ahead and, un and unmute. For those um, particular loans, how long do, um, how long are they, like six months, one year? No, you can get a, 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 a five one where it rates fixed for five years and it just annually thereafter. A seven works the same way, fixed for seven years. You can get 30 year fixed rate loans. Okay, there's, I'm talking about on the, on, the, on the investment ones you were talking about with no... Yes. Okay, all right, good to know. And Brilliant. those products are constantly evolving and I have more and more lenders coming out with them. So there's lots of variations. Okay, Excellent. fantastic. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Carly, bring um, us home with, uh, with that question uh, that you have, please. And then we're going to uh, ask that any other questions for Karen get popped in the chat so we can uh, take that next step and move forward. Go ahead, Carly. Um, do you need to close, like, are you able to close in an LLC or do you need to close personally? Okay. In, in those no income verification loans, they, they all, all of them, you can close in an LLC. Your conventional loans, they still want you to close in your own personal name. And then you can, you know, do what you like there, you know, after close. Okay. And then the other question is, um, do you guys do a hundred percent of the rehab loan? on like the, uh, either, whether someone's like burr, like doing the burr method or if they're flipping? If they're fixing and flipping, um, yeah, they do the, the um, they give you the purchase money and the renovation funds. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, they're Carly. great loans, great opportunities. Raquel, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Yes, so I just wanted to, ask, I, I was trying to attempt the same thing and they told me like uh, the debt versus, uh, your income versus uh, debt ratio. Um, and now that I'm hearing about the no income verification loan, it's just because um, I would be a first time homeowner and I just want to be limited. It seems most can have an income that it will take me the. So Raquel, unfortunately, we're, we're not hearing you so well. Right. So go, go ahead and, and Karen's going to put her information in the chat. So if you have personal scenarios that you want to run by Karen, uh, she's going to pop her name in the chat there. You can you can call her afterwards or email directly. I'm, I'm sorry, we just we, it just sounded like you were underwater. We're hoping you're not underwater, 
If there's a flood issue in your house, please put 911 in the chat and we'll make sure we send someone right away. But I think it was just an internet <laughs> issue. Um, Maribel, go ahead and ask your question. Well, it's not Maribel, it's her husband. Uh, is Karen licensed in New York? Yes, she is. <laughs> yeah, I'm in New York and Connecticut. Thanks for asking. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. We'll, we be, have, in we have, we, we'll be in touch. We have several things going on. Okay, great. Excellent. I put Excellent. my information in the chat, by the way, earlier. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and so, Karen, if you can, if you can just put your, your your info in the chat a couple of more times throughout, so that I will. We're, we're working up and down. Um, there are a couple of questions in the uh, in the chat. In the interest of time, um, I think Steve uh, Steve had his hand raised. We're going to ask Steve to go ahead and ask his question, and then we're going to move on from the from the financing questions. If we have time at the end, we can kind of jump back in there, or you can have some separate conversations going on with Karen in the chat. So Steve, go ahead and ask that question. And you are muted, so you will have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that, Karen. Thank you all, appreciate the uh, the invite here. I had a quick question on the multifamily. Um, mm -hmm. Is it have to be, does it have to be your initial investment property? So for example, if you have an investment property and you wanna, you have, let's say a 60% LTV, you can take out three and a half percent off that, that, that initial investment property? Um, no, you can't take three and uh, the FHAs are for primary residences only. They can be one to four units, but you can't use the three and a half percent down to um, on the investment property. So essentially, if I wanted to take equity out of the investment property to buy a multifamily, would I would I qualify for an FHA at three and a half percent? No, well, you cannot buy um, investment okay. property with an FHA loan. You can you, okay. fifteen percent. You can use for conventional loans, and you can use the the uh, no income verification loans to take out funds if you want to, you know, for down payment and you know take cash out if you like, or refinance as well. Okay, thank you. Excellent, thanks, Steve. Uh, and so Karen, just a couple of, of last things in, in my notes I wanna make sure we get on the table, and that is um, from, from, a, from a money and financing perspective, um, there's also, you could find a partner. So if, if, so if you don't qualify yourself, you could decide to do that in, a, in some sort of a, of a partnership and utilize uh, somebody else's credit score to kind of help boost the scenario. Do you find that that, that, is, uh, that works as well? It does work. You can um, actually, with a partner, they use the middle score and they use the higher of the two, which is kind of cool. This yeah. is the only instance that they do that. Yeah, so awesome. So you can always partner with somebody. Of course, if you're partnering with someone, you wanna go sh through a full vetting process of that partner, right? But not just that it's somebody you met last week and it's convenient, you wanna make sure because you're going into business with somebody, but that is another path that one can go down. Uh, you can look at, at real estate investment groups. Uh, you know, in, in our offices, we have, right now we have two separate real estate investment groups. There are about 40 of us or so who are uh, invested uh, through those real estate uh, investment groups. I know some of you are on the, on the call tonight, and right? So that's a great way to kind of get your uh, foot in the door if you either don't have the funds to do it on your own and you're kind of saving the funds, you can, you can start the process with less money um, invested. Or if you have the funds and you just don't want to deal with the, 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 the management of the asset and the, and the, the process side of it, uh, real estate investment groups could be also another way for people to get involved. And then the last one that, that people always ask about is what about like REITs or self-directed IRAs? Is that another opportunity that people have to access funds? Yeah, I mean, you can access funds, you know, in any way that gives you the, the cash flow that you need for down payment. You know, most of these lenders don't, um, they're not looking at your at paper trailing the down payment in the same way as your, you know, conventional loans. Some of them will allow you to have just one month of assets and it can be anything that's just recently deposited. You could get a gift if you wanted from family. They, they all work a little bit differently and depending upon your particular financial situation, you know, we'll find the, the best lender with the product that'll work for you. Got it, got it, got it. Excellent, well, so again, um, Karen's gonna put her information in the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out to her. Uh, kind of after the call tomorrow. Uh, if, if you have other questions you want to pop into the uh, into the chat box, Karen will be monitoring those financial questions there. 
uh, while we kind of move forward. Karen, thank you so much. As always. Just so everyone here understands that when you find someone who is talented and has your best interests uh, at heart, uh, you hold on to them and you don't let go. And that's what I have done uh, with, with Karen. Uh, she makes, she makes the, the system that I have in place to, to do this at scale just so much simpler than if I had to start from scratch every single time. She knows, she knows what I, what I want, what I don't want. She, she doesn't, <laughs> she, now this might scare some of you, but this is, this is something that Karen and I have worked out. She didn't call me anymore to ask me if, if I want to rock lock at a certain rate. She, she makes those decisions it. for me because she has my best interests at heart. And so she just knows this is, this is not going to get better than this. I'm going to lock him. I'll let him know later. Right. She respects the fact that, that I'm doing other things and she's, she's kind of in charge of, of the financing for my properties and to have somebody kind of in charge of that financing is a, is a, is a gift from above. So um, thank you, Karen, for everything that you do for me. And um, I, I reluctantly offer you to others. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. It's a gift that keeps on giving. So yeah. I expect all 95 of you to call me tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Setting proper expectations is always good. All right. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thank again, Karen's going to hang around for the rest of our time. So uh, if you I have wish till tomorrow later, make sure that um, that we uh, will come back. And if there again, if there are other questions, please put them in the chat or come back at the end and we'll um, we'll see if we can't get them in. All right, so I am going to take me down off the spotlight um, and just kind of run through uh, the last couple of money things that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, two things, really. The first is uh, people oftentimes ask me cash versus uh, versus financing. You may notice that uh, or may have noticed that I, I, I finance everything. Uh, with money being so cheap, using somebody else's money to me is uh, kind of a, a no-brainer. But if, if you kind of want me to prove it, um, there's some math that we could do. Don't freak out. I'll do the math. I know it's late. Math is not always fun late at night. Uh, however, um, if, if, you, if you remember earlier this evening, I said that uh, I had taken money out of, uh, out of a house that I bought and went and bought a condo cash. Well, that condo kind of meets my criteria of throwing off $1,000 or better a month net. That actually throws off about $1,100 a month uh, net and has since the day that I, uh, that I bought it. And so the idea of, um, of return is kind of what I look at, right? I took $180,000 and traded it for, if it's $1,100, times 12 months, about $13,000 a year. So $13,000 a year in return on the $180,000 I spent on that asset gives me a return of about 7% on that $180,000, right? It's way better than what anybody's getting in, in any kind of bank account, right? And yet if you're invested in the stock market over time, that, that may seem like a, a, a little bit light. Well, it seems a little light to me as well. That was my first foray into investment property purchases. And as I said, what I would do differently today is I'd take that same $180,000 and buy three multifamilies instead of one condo, right? That's the down payment on three of the multis that I buy that still bring me that $1,000 a month in return. So in that scenario, had I, had I taken the $180,000 and only put down 25%, that would have been $45,000 instead of the whole 180 to still generate almost as much, right? Because the mortgage, the mortgage on, on that amount of money is, is relatively small. So if I take the $13,000 and, and really make it more like $11,000 in, um, in terms of that return, now you're looking at annually, Be helpful if I could press the buttons. You're looking at a better than 20% cash on cash return, right? So, so make sure that you're looking at um, at the the opportunity that exists to use other people's money. The debt service is is minimal uh, in the course of of a month or a year. You, you can still find properties that that pay off exactly what you're looking for, right? We're going to move into criteria right now, and one of my criteria is a thousand dollars a month, right? 
And so $1,000 a month net to me, if, if it's not pulling that in, right, I look for, I look for uh, something else to purchase, or I look to see if I can make some changes to the property in terms of raising the rents, right? If the rents are below market and I'm raising the rents over the course of the first year, I may still move forward if it's in that eight to $900 a month uh, scenario. But that's, that's ultimately why I don't buy cash for anything, right? It would save me way more, take me way more time to save up that amount of cash to buy something else when I can just save up 25% and pull the trigger again and again and again. The last thing I wanna talk about in terms of money is um, if you're looking to scale this, recognize that the rents that you receive, the profit from your first one, you should just put in the bank and not spend. And use that to grow the down payment to buy the second one, and then you have two. And so now you have double the amount of profit and you use that to buy the third one. And then you buy the profits from the first three to buy four and five. And then you use the profits from the first five to buy six, seven, and eight, right? And it's, it just goes faster and faster and faster if, you'll, if you're reinvesting and reinvesting and reinvesting. Make sense? Okay. All right, so let's jump into, uh, into criteria. And um, what do I mean when I say criteria? Right? You, you need to have some kind of understanding of who you want to be and what you want to buy, and then get real clear about carving out a foundation of what that criteria looks like so you can use it as a barometer to say yes or no to properties. Right? Or, or else your purchases become way too subjective. Right? Remember, this, this is... Being an investor is, is a, you're, not, you're not buying to live, generally speaking, right? And so, so there's a more objective eye that you bring to the table. There's a more objective uh, path that you walk down. And, you, and if you set a foundation of what those objective criteria are and don't stray from that criteria, trust me, I've made that mistake. Oh, my criteria is this. Oh, but I like that house. I like it for this reason and that reason and this reason. So let's buy it. Well, then it, but then it doesn't cash flow the way you want it to cash flow because of X, Y, and Z, right? And I'll give you an example of that shortly. So the first thing that, that I would encourage you to do is figure out what kind of investor you want to be. As I said to you before, I chose buy and hold, right? There's buy and flip. Right, some of you on here I know have have experience in buy and flip. I, I do not, so I'm not your guy for buy and flip questions. Right, if you're flipping properties, um, we can certainly set up uh, an expert in that and, and have another seminar on that in the in the coming months. But I'm not your guy for that. I'm also not really the guy. I, I don't I don't purposely not buy for appreciation, but it's not why I started, and it's not what I necessarily put higher than my, my monthly return. And what I mean by that is I buy most of my properties in, uh, in Waterbury. I own in, in, uh, in Danbury, in Ridgefield, in New London, in Naugatuck, and in, uh, and in Waterbury. Most of my portfolio is in Waterbury. And the last time I, the last time I actually had this seminar uh, live and in person was pre-pandemic. And I said to that room full of people, you know, I never expect the properties that I have purchased in Waterbury to be worth more than what they were when I bought them. That's not why I bought them. I bought them because I could get them for a small amount of money, a small down payment, and that they were churning out the, the kind of money a month that I was looking for. I was focused on the cash flow, not the appreciation. Of course, what's happened since then is that all of those properties are worth uh, some of them are worth double what I paid for them. Some of them are worth, you know, not quite double what I paid for them. Um, and yet, you know, and we've been talking recently about, all right, well, what if, what if we just sold them all at this point, right? There's a, there's a, there's probably a seven figure chunk of money in, in equity that didn't exist when I started buying these, these properties nine years ago, that if I cashed out on any, everything, I could feel really, really good about having that amount of money sitting someplace. But then the question becomes, what do you do with that money that's going to create the return that it's returning me invested in those pieces of real estate, right? 
So sure, it's great to, to be able to buy low and sell high, but then you have to actually do something with the money. And I'm not willing to wait around until the market comes down again, right? So, so again, different people have different thoughts about, uh, about the, the, uh, whether that's smart or not. <clears throat> I'm just in a, in a continual buying mode till I hit that 40. And for those of you who know me, you know, once I hit 40, we're going to turn it into 80. So that, that'll, that'll be the next, give me a couple of years and come back and we'll, we'll start having that conversation, right? But back to criteria. So you have to decide who you are, right? I decided buy and hold for cash flow. Then you need to decide, well, what kind of cash flow are you looking for? So, so what is your expectation of your investment property, right? I know people in other parts of the country who, who they're happy with uh, if they if they buy a property and it cash flows at least hundred dollars a month, uh, they're they're good with that. Uh, I can tell you as somebody who self managed for the first six years uh, and only moved to property management for the last three years, hundred dollars a month for what I was doing that one that was no thank you. I I think I'd rather go get a a, a second job at a fast food restaurant. It's just that was not I was not interested in that, right? Which is why I set my target at a thousand dollars a month, and so so now the math has to work based on what the rents are or could be, how much the taxes are, what are the other expenses, and what what are we paying uh, for the property, which converts into debt service. When you do the math, and I'll I'll bring that uh, that spreadsheet up shortly so you can see what that looks like. Does that hit that thousand dollar a month trigger? If yes. Great. Then we kind of move through the next the next hoop. But that's the very first thing that we look at when anything comes to our to, comes to us. We start to look at that uh, about the math first. Now, since we've moved to property management, we've relaxed that thousand dollars a month a little bit because because paying the property managers eats into some of the uh, some of that return. Uh, and as the as the market's gotten uh, gotten tighter and tighter in terms of inventory, it's been harder and harder to find those thousand dollars a month. So we've relaxed that down to that 850 or 900 spot, knowing that the other thing that we can do is continue to raise rents as the market continues to climb, right? So we're gonna make it up on that side. We also, we also look at, at location. And Jonathan, I'll get there in just a second, right? Um, we also look at location. W where are we purchasing, right? We choose uh, to, to purchase in uh, cities rather than towns because the, the renter pool is uh, is uh, is uh, far greater than you know in, in smaller towns. We choose to uh, to buy in towns that have major highways running through them because now we have um, commuting as an opportunity. We choose to buy in towns uh, specifically where there are, where there might be colleges. Right, Waterbury has has UConn. Um, are there hospitals? Waterbury has its own hospital. It's right on the on the uh, T of Route 84 and Route 8. Right. So all these different things kind of come into play for us about where we're going to purchase such that, such that the, the pool of tenants supports the portfolios that we're looking to build. The other thing that you want to be sure of is, is you, want to, you want to be sure that there are services, right? You want to be sure that there are, which is another reason we buy kind of in cities, right? There's, you have cabs, you have buses, you, you, people can walk to things, right? So again, it just, it creates more of a, of a tenant pool than, uh, than not. And of course, one of the, one of the other um, issues with location is well, what is real estate cost there, right? I don't buy typically in Fairfield County because it costs three times as much money to buy the same exact piece of property and the rents are not that much different than what I buy in Waterbury or Nautatuck or New London for way less money, right? So I can save those down payments far faster. Jonathan, Jeff, question? Yeah, there, Rick. Uh, Rick, quick question. So what, what, what was the radius that you looked in when buying a house? Did you go like like what was that location like? It, I'm I'm located in Stanford. I feel like when I go into the market and I search homes in Danbury, there's a lot more opportunities out there. But the thing I'm scared of is that I'm not really familiar with Danbury, and I really don't know what it's like. And what a lot of people tell me is start off in in your own backyard. I wanted to see what was your opinion on that. 
Well, I, I don't disagree with that, except if except if you if there's better opportunities someplace else, or if you can't afford your own backyard, right? I mean, I, I live in Richfield, and I, I did buy that one condo. But when I started to actually make a move to to purchase additional properties, I I, I couldn't afford anything locally, right? Including including up in Danbury or down in Norwalk. I, I, the, the, I, I just I didn't I didn't have the money, and I didn't ha I didn't want to have to save up and save up and save up for down payments. To buy four or five hundred thousand dollar properties, so so I just started to look around to see where else, uh, where else that opportunity existed, and then what I did is I just went and learned Waterbury, right? I went and I, I I asked questions. I found people who who knew who knew better. I connected with a real estate agent um, out that out that way, right? And so so I I used resources to help me learn what I didn't know, and went from there right i now know exactly where i want to buy i know where not to buy i know you know where where the rents will suffer if i do purchase there and where the rents are going to be higher right but i had to learn all that so you can learn it in any area you just have to you have to just spend the time if that helps thank you um and so so then the um continuing on with with criteria um condition we always look at condition um for, for us, what we purchase, I'd rather spend a little bit more money to buy something in a little bit better condition than spend less money and have to spend time and, and extra, uh, extra cash fixing things up, right? Because now you have to GC the project, you have to oversee it, you're spending additional cash. If you spend a little more for the, for the asset up front, well, you're still financing 75% of it, right? So, so you're, you're actually using less of uh, less of your cash because I'd rather take some of that cash, um, finance the uh, a higher uh, number on the asset that I'm purchasing, and use the extra cash to go buy something else, right? So we kind of look and see what that what that looks like, <clears throat> and we tend to buy um, not palaces certainly, right? However, but th they're they're properties that that don't need kitchens and baths redone. We, we, we're not interested in having to rip off the roof and put a new roof on, right? So we tend to buy things that, that where those things have been done already, which means we spend a little bit more than, than what you could spend on properties that, uh, that don't. Um, <clears throat> the expenses we, we kind of look at, we're always looking at uh, heat. You know, what kind of heat does it have? Uh, we prefer gas heat over everything and anything else. Um, Electric heat in investment properties uh, is fine, except A, it can sometimes hold rents down because some tenants are unwilling to pay a, a, a premium rent and know that they have electric heat because electric heat is expensive, right? That there, there's, I don't think there's any argument uh, in, this, in this room around the fact that, that electric heat uh, can be expensive. And so, uh, so we have found that sometimes that's a balancing act where if they have to pay for the electric and they know that those numbers are going to be high, they're willing to pay less in rent. Uh, the other issue is that when you have vacancies in the winter, guess who gets to pay the electric heat? You do, right? And so, so I don't love electric heat. I do own properties that have some electric heat, um, but we, we, we push real hard for, uh, for gas. Gas is the, is the winner across, uh, across them all in my book. We also don't love oil. Uh, we, we own one or two properties where the first floor is oil heat. And the, the struggle there is that, you know, tenants oftentimes forget about filling the oil tank. And if that happens and the oil runs out and it sucks the gunk into the, uh, into the boiler, you then have a, a repair issue that, you know, that, that is not necessary if you, uh, if, so we, we, those properties we put people on uh, mandatory service contracts and uh, and have mandatory delivery schedules, right? Uh, that gets tough though if if all of a sudden they don't have any money. So we like gas, uh, but we we pay attention to that to make sure that uh, to make sure that that's not going to come back and bite us. Uh, we we prefer to buy houses that already have their own owner's meter for electric, right? Um, we've had issues where when we've purchased properties, and what that means is if you're buying a multifamily, each floor has their own meter, and then the common areas, the hallways and the, the basement are, um, are wired for the owner's meter. And so your owner's meter, my owner's meters cost me anywhere from 12 to $20 a month, maybe $25 a month, right? It's not a big expense, 
but if you don't have that, uh, sometimes what can happen is somebody decides that they're paying for the electric for the basement and somebody left the basement light on. And so now you have a whole issue about somebody spending money that, that's uh, to light a prop part of the property that's not theirs. So, so we've, we've had to put owner's meters in to correct some of those issues. So we prefer to buy them with owner's meters already in. Same with like motion lighting in the, in the common stairways. Right? We prefer to have the motion lighting already in place, but we don't love properties that, that, um, that don't have that. that. That to me is a liability issue. And so we just prefer to look for that kind of stuff. So these are just, I'm just describing some of the things that we go through when we're vetting a property. Um, again, we don't love the mechanicals or the roof to be, uh, to be uh, in, in desperate condition. Um, we look at things like corner lots versus non-corner lots. Right, When you buy a property on a corner lot, well, now you have sidewalks on both sides. And so you're just paying more in maintenance and snow removal fees than, than you would if you just have a property with, with a single street frontage. Um, you know, we look, at, we look at the trees on the property. A couple of years ago, we had a big tree on one of our properties come down and, and hit the house, right? And so now we, now we pay closer attention to what kind of trees are on the property. Um, we, we look at, at land, right? Sometimes Sometimes when we, when we vet a property, there's something's like, oh, well, there's an extra lot that you get with it right next door. All those woods or all that lawn. Oh, how spectacular. I don't view that as a positive at all, right? It's just more to maintain. It's more to pay taxes on. It's, it's a liability, right? So I, I'd rather not have that. We look at outbuildings, right? Are, is there an, an exterior garage or a shed on the property? To me, that's just more to ensure and more to maintain and, and more for the tenants to get themselves in trouble with. Right. So so we don't we don't love outbuildings. So, again, all of these uh, all of these issues that that pop up are all part of our criteria. And we kind of go through and check the boxes and see each property. Does it does it meet the criteria? Does it fall short? If it falls short, which areas? There are some that we're willing to give a little bit on if the if the money makes sense, some that we're not willing to give uh, to give on. You know, tenants versus no tenants. Well, we, you know, usually we inherit tenants. We'd prefer to, to uh, take a, a vacant property because then we can vet our own tenants versus inheriting tenants that we didn't put in there. And yet most properties today are conveying with, uh, with tenants in place. And so, you know, if the property is, if, if the asset is valuable enough uh, from, a, from a cash flow perspective, we roll the dice a little bit and make sure that we, we onboard them well and, and see how that goes. Um, any questions on criteria, Moses? What what um, situation would you be able to, if you do buy a property with the tenant in, at what point can you uh, remove them and bring your own? Is there a situation where you could do that? Uh, yes, at the end of the lease or if they voluntarily um, decide to, to depart, like in a cash for keys scenario, I think we did that one time where, you know, we said, okay, we'll, we'll pay you X amount of dollars to, to not be here anymore. Uh, other than that, you have to wait till the end of the lease, or if they're in violation of the lease that you've inherited, you can, you can evict, right? But those are really the only options that you, uh, that you have. Uh, somebody in the chat asked if I had any experience with solar power. Uh, I do not. Uh, I, will, I will tell you the experience I have with solar power is as a broker uh, of, of uh, 600 real estate agents. And on the brokerage side, I can tell you that um, inheriting solar that was put in by somebody else can, can, can be tricky. Um, some of you may have done it. Some of you may have solar power, uh, solar panels on your house. Um, to me, for an investment property, it is, uh, it's something that, that I think I would want to be monitoring more. Uh, so I, I would I would say no thanks on that. Now, I may be missing something on it, and yet I think that for me, that might be up more on my no column than on the, uh, on the yes column. John? Uh, hey, Rick. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, so um, what does your conversation look like when you initially start, um, started vetting um, property managers? Uh, I'm going to get to that in a second. So hold that question. I'm going to get to uh, managing the asset. Ilga, did I say that right? Yes, Ilga. Thanks, Rick. Um, what about age of the home? Do you try to avoid super old, 100-year-old homes, or do you uh, not have many options in the towns you're looking in? 
Yeah, so so you hit it right on the head with your second comment, right? Everything I own is a hundred or one hundred and twenty-five years old. Uh, I, I don't I don't think I own except except the few condos that I own um, in Danbury and Ridgefield. Everything else I own is, was built a hundred or more years ago. That's that's for the multifamilies that that ultimately are available in those in those cities that I purchase in. That it's just what it is. Um, it, I'd be lying if I said in like in the old days, it would freak me out a little bit more, a little bit, you know, just to kind of say, all right, what, what, what can I expect in maintaining a property that's, that's old like that? Uh, and what I have found is that as long as you are um, working to, to do valid upkeep and you don't, you know, you, you decide that being a slumlord is not what you're, what you're interested in. Um, Cause frankly, being a slumlord is, is a, is a bad decision on a whole lot of different levels. Um, First and foremost, it, it doesn't make you. It, you're a better human if you're not a slumlord. And 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 the idea of you know one of the one of the things that that I take pretty seriously is in the areas that I buy in. Um, part of the reason I keep buying in those areas is because they've been really good to me financially. And at this point, those cities have been good enough to me financially that I kind of feel like I I owe them. The, I owe them at least a continued investment in making making those cities bigger and better, and allowing for um, allowing for uh, the residents of those cities to have places to live that they can be proud of, that they that they don't have to live in in crappy, rundown buildings, right? So so there is a human element to keeping up your properties um, that I take pretty seriously. And there's also, there's also the, the version of, if you don't take care of your property, guess what? The property is going to cost you more and more and more. Deferred maintenance always costs more than, um, than proactive preventative maintenance. Um, so that's kind of how we look at that. And, and so it doesn't, it doesn't freak me out anymore. And it, 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 it just is what's available. So you were hundred percent right about that. Um, Jonathan, did you have a question? Yeah, Rick, uh, when looking at an investment property, what's like what type of things do you usually stay away from? Like if, for example, let's say a house needs roof work, will you stay away from that? Or, you know, what's your requirements? It, it depends on how much, right? And so, so now that we uh, have connected with a property management company, um, which as I said, I'll talk about in just a second, where are we with time? Okay, so uh, I do have to move a little faster. The, the um, my answer to that is we pretty much assess uh, the condition of the roof. Uh, we do have an inspection so that the inspector will assess the condition of the roof. From what we see, we'll make a decision sometimes as to whether or not to move forward with uh, uh, with even if offering on the property. And then when the inspector comes, um, I think one time uh, we didn't really see what he saw and we decided to, to walk away from a, from a property. But again, now that we've connected with a, a property management company, our property managers also have a construction company. And so sometimes it's a, if it's a simple patch area or, you know, just the thing over the shed, you know, the little shed roof in the back has to be replaced. Um, they're, the cost to cure some of that uh, when you have your own people uh, is, is not all that much. And so we weigh the pros and cons of the cost to cure versus what we're paying versus what the return might be and make decisions that way. Right. So just if the numbers make sense, you have them coach you on whatever, and then if it makes sense, then you go on from there. Yeah, and so and so, what you just said, I'll just repeat. If the numbers make sense, our answer is yes. I've been asked so many questions over the last two years about, oh, the market's going crazy, there's low inventory, people are fighting, prices are high, you must not be buying. And I, that is, that's exactly the opposite of what I've been doing. I've been out there buying like crazy. Have I been paying more? Sure but there's never a bad time to buy good real estate, right? It, it, if the numbers work, the numbers work. It, it, when I used to pay $175,000 and now I have to pay $210,000, the differential there in, in the down payment is, is not enough to deter me. And the differential in debt service, knowing that the rents have also moved up a bit uh, in the last two years, it, I'm still making the same or better money, even though I have to spend a little bit more. So. None of that really frightens me um, all that much. Got it, thank you. Sure thing. So I did promise you a look at this um, at this spreadsheet. So I do want to do that because uh, I, I don't I don't 
really don't want to hold you hostage for the entire evening. Um, so this is the spreadsheet that I use to vet my properties. Uh, this is uh, 26 Grandview is one of the properties that I just purchased. Uh, I paid $244,000 for it. So I'm just going to run through what this looks like. So I paid you the purchase price. You pop in here at 244. Uh, as Karen said, 25% down is the uh, is the minimum you can put down on um, on a three family, which means I had a $61,000 down payment on this particular property, and my amount financed was 183,000. Right now, um, and Karen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm still using about 4%. Uh, they may be a smidge higher for um, for investment properties right now, but the last couple that I bought were in the high threes to 4%. Maybe that's just the rate that I get. I don't know, Karen, you'll have to tell me. You, you, you give me special treatment. So, so at 4%- You are special. <laughs> well, that's true. My it, mother I mean, has told it, me that for years. You, rates are in the mid fours right now on, on investment property. They just right. recently rent, you know, went up a bit over the last 30 days. Yeah. So I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to keep it at four and then I'm going to go and change it to four and a half just so you see how that, how that changes things. Right. So the monthly mortgage payment here is $873. You then move through this spreadsheet and you pop in the monthly rents for the units, right? For this particular unit, it's 1100, 1100 and 995. So um, that gives us 3,195 is our gross rental income. We use a 3% vacancy rate, which gives us about 3,100 as the net rental income, right? Property management fees are 10%. We pay our property managers 10% of, uh, of the rent that they collect to manage the properties. So that's $310. We always throw hundred bucks in there a month for, for leasing costs, just because when you have to change um, tenants, there is some cost. Uh, over and above the just the management fee uh, for the for the leasing of to the new tenants. That's certainly not every month, and sometimes it doesn't happen in the course of a year if you have uh, folks who are staying uh, staying with you. <clears throat> but we throw it in just to uh, just to add a little cushion in. Utilities, the utilities that you ultimately are are responsible for in a multifamily situation are uh, water and the owner's meter. Right, so water plus the owner's meter is about 150 or so dollars a month, about $1,800 a year. Property taxes for this particular property were 47 and change. Uh, and so that term comes out to about $394 a month. Uh, insurance uh, for these properties that I buy is always one side or the other of $2,000 or so. So I use 165 uh, unless the property is bigger or older or, um, or is in, um, worse shape than uh, than normal then we we might add a little to that and then the other you know you have to pay someone to even though we try not to buy things with with lawn on them right because uh, you have to mow the lawn um there's there's weed whacking that happens or or small mows uh um some some snow removal in the winter so a hundred dollars a month for maintenance uh, we build in there as well so the total expenses of 12 19 taken from the net rental income of 3,100 gives you just shy of $1,900 in net operating income. And then of course you have to pay the mortgage, right? So this is, this is your income. This is the mortgage payment, which means this is your profit. So the net cash flow then is just over $1,000, um, which in this scenario is why we said yes to this property. Now, if I were buying this property today and not last month, right, at four and a half percent, the interest rate brings that number up just a smidge, right? And it probably brings my number down to just under $1,000, right? In this scenario, this property was in, in good enough shape that we would have said yes to this as well, even though it was just under the $1,000, because remember that takes into consideration paying the property managers. And with three bedroom units, which this is, we can probably push this up into at least 1050, if not the 1100. Um, once we change out the tenant. And so that brings that back to just over $1,000. Any questions on the use of uh, this spreadsheet? I know I went through it quickly. However, it's a great tool. And again, if you want it, just connect with the agent who invited you here tonight. I will make sure that they all have it tomorrow morning and so they can get it off to you. Um, get it off to you at some point.
point tomorrow. Moses, go ahead. Yeah, um, so this is based on 25% down payment, correct? Now, if you were doing a 3.5% or lower than 25%, those number, the, the final um, profit is going to be different. Yeah, so, so if I weren't buying a multifamily and, and I could get away with only 15%, say everything was the same, right? With 15%, well, then your mortgage payment's um, going to be higher, right? Because you're putting, you're, put, you're financing more. So you have less cash that you have to take out of pocket. The mortgage payment's going to be higher and it brings the net cash flow down a bit. Not dramatically, but down a bit. It's why this spreadsheet is so awesome because you can just you can just play, right? What what if this? What if that? What if we raise the rents? What if I have right? So so you have that tool then to just kind of plug the numbers in, right? If you do it enough, I, I can start looking at properties now when they when they come to me. I'm like, okay, well, the taxes are high on that one, which is going to eat into the into the into the profits. Are the are the rents at least? normal to, to high themselves to offset some of the taxes because the rest of it is pretty standard, right? The expenses for most of those properties, they're all pretty standard. The, the, the owner's meter, the water, all pretty standard, right? Taxes can, can ebb and flow. I have some properties where the taxes are $1,800 a year and I have some taxes where I have some as high as $8,000 a year, right? And so the, the rents for the ones that have higher taxes need to be more substantial to make sure that my, uh, my nets stay where I need them. Any questions on the on the spreadsheet or doing the math? No. All right, so let me let me just talk uh, for two minutes about managing the asset and then I'll, I'll answer any questions that we have. Uh, it is uh, it is 803. So if you have to go, I understand it was lovely to have you here. Uh, I'm going to go for probably another 10 or 12 minutes or so based on, on questions that, uh, that you guys have. But before I do that, let me just say this. Uh, as I said, for the first six years, I self-managed. Um, that got us to a point. I did that until about 12 properties, which was about 35 rental units, right? Because most of my properties are three families. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we did that on purpose because we got to save the money that we would pay a property manager and just continue to roll that money. You saw $300 a month, you know, $300 a month turns into $3,600 a year times a couple of different properties. All of a sudden you can, you can bank that cash and use it towards your next down payment. So we wanted to grow faster. So we self-managed. Um, self-management was awesome from the perspective of, I got to learn a whole lot about a whole lot of things that I didn't exactly know about. And yet, uh, I will tell you that it at some point it hampered my growth, right? Because at 12 properties, uh, this wasn't what I was doing for my full-time job. I was doing it outside of my my job and my life, uh, and it became it became uh, it became kind of all-consuming, right? I couldn't afford time-wise, even though I could afford financially to buy another property, I couldn't afford to add three more rental units to what I was already managing. So at some point you reach a level where, where self-management really starts to limit your growth. And so we started to look for property management. Um, there's not a ton of property management companies out there. So, uh, which is maybe what drove that, that question, Jonathan, right? So uh, we found somebody who was connected to one of our agents, right? The property managers that we have in place is, is the cousin of one of our agents. And so it was, it was, all nepotism and all you know networking uh and we've been really happy with them um we've been really happy with them since we engaged them uh, i will tell you that uh, when you do hire a property management company it is my personal opinion that you need to understand how they run properties and make sure that it aligns with how you run properties right there are some property management companies out there that are more than happy to let things fall into disrepair and run more like slumlord style um, style properties, uh, this was not this was not the folks that we um, that we hired, and yet there were certain things that they did that we wanted done differently, and so I like to believe that we brought a level of 
of demand to them that helped them get better at what they did based on the things that were important to us. And they also made us better investors by, by giving us their insights about different ways to do things so that we could be more effective and efficient, right? So um, if, if management of the asset, if, if your issue is, I don't wanna be called in the middle of the night when somebody's toilet is clogged, there are a couple of ways, and trust me, neither did we. And we just, when we self-managed, we just set up a, a team and a system that made sure they didn't call us in the middle of the night. Right. And so when we were self-managing, we just worked real hard and built a team and we made sure that and that team was a plumber and an electrician and emergency numbers and, you know, a, anybody, a, a, a pest, a, a pest person. So we knew who to call. And then we just gave our tenants the go to list. Like if some if an emergency happens that has to do with water don't call me. I live, I live 45 minutes away. Like, don't call me, call the plumber and, and they'll come and take care of it. If there's something going on with, with your electric, call the electrician, right? Those people know that they need to get a hold of me for certain things and that they should just go and fix it for other things. I've worked that out with the team. So from a self-management perspective, I, I wholeheartedly encourage, um, having a team in place so that you just know who to call and then tell your tenants who to call so that you don't necessarily have to be the one who, who runs over with the plunger at two o'clock in the morning. I, and I can't, I can't, there's not an amount of money that I can, I can put my finger on that would, that that would be attractive to me. Right. And I can see by the looks on your faces that it's not appealing to you either. Right. So the idea of, uh, of, um, of self-management is not as scary as you think, as long as you build a local team to help help you manage the asset, right? In terms of rent collection, that that can that does fall on you without without property management. Uh, the the key there is you just set up you set up a zillion different ways to have them pay you, um, accept everything, uh, push digital. You know, Venmo is is the simplest and the easiest, and um, you know, be strict about when rent is due and uh, how you're going to work out how you're going to work out issues. Once property management takes over, right? All those, all the, all that kind of leaves your plate, and because uh, they only get paid on the rent that they collect, so that now they're real strict about about setting those those rents up. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to stop um, talking and ask you what you want to hear. What didn't I cover? If there are there things that you want to uh, know about that we didn't talk about. Uh, Irfan, go ahead and ask that question. The question is uh, how much money you need to be uh, starting with investment and uh, is any investment group uh, recently going to start or we could join uh, existing investment groups? Um, so, so are you asking how much money do you need to kind of buy that first one? I'm asking you if you have some investment group already or any group new starting or uh, I could uh, uh, I mean uh, enter in existing groups also. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, so so no, I personally don't have um, don't have groups that are open to the public. If you want to get your real estate license and join my company, then you can you can come and invest um, in our real estate group. So so the the two groups that I have, I, have, I am already in your group, uh, real estate co uh, company, and I am working in a Stanford office. Oh my goodness! Okay, so well, I apologize for that. You and I have not met officially, and so I apologize for that. So uh, we just we just closed the last investment group. We will have another investment group probably open again by the summer and you and I can talk. So shoot me a text or an email and I'm happy to set up some time for us to talk about that. Excellent. Uh, Jennifer or Chad, I'm not sure which of you is uh, which of you is has the question. Yes, this is Chad. Thank you. Chad. Um, so my question is, and maybe we missed it. Where are you finding rental properties on MLS wholesalers? off market where's the best yes. place to look in certain areas so my answer to that my personal answer to that is yes yes and yes um i buy a lot of things retail off the mls i i do have connections with 
uh, some wholesalers who, who bring opportunities to me. Uh, I also have a kind of a network of uh, of off-market opportunities that I've created with property management companies, my own property managers who, who have additional um, networks. And so what I would say to you is uh, if, uh, first and foremost, connect with your agent, right? Because they, they oftentimes have the, uh, have the connections and the, um, and the relationships to be able to find you things that may be off-market. Off uh, they also perhaps have connections through me that I could perhaps help uh, in, in those scenarios. So it, it's today, it's a lot about who you know, because uh, inventory is, is tight. However, I'm going to tell you in the last week, just in Waterbury, there were 10 or 12 new properties that came on that um, uh, two of them I've already jumped on and a couple of other ones we're looking to vet for uh, potentials this weekend. So uh, stuff is coming on, uh, even if you're buying retail, which, by the way, for some people, and maybe some of you on this call, some people think that buying retail is like a dirty word. Uh, most of the things I own, I have been just purchased retail uh, off the MLS. Does that help that answer the question? It does. Thank you. Sure thing. What else? Anybody else have a question? Yes, Linda. Okay, so we have eight units. And the thing that scares me most is that some economists that predicted the last 2008 meltdown are saying there's gonna be a depression mid-decade and it could be worse than our depression where we had 25% unemployment that our grandparents had. And we saw what New York did to landlords. Connecticut governor could do the same thing next time and say, Tenants don't have to pay rent. So, what do you, what, does that, do you have concerns about that? And are you making plans just in case with our 30 trillion debt that there's going to be a meltdown at some point um, so that you're safe? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer it uh, as honestly as I can. My, my fast answer is no. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. And, and maybe, like I said, I, I might not be the smartest investor you'll ever meet. I might not be the smartest investor on this call, but I, I don't worry about it because um, the, one of the reasons that I buy multifamilies is because I believe that there is a built-in built safety net uh, inside of a multifamily, right? Where, where even if I have somebody who loses their job, I still have two other units. Even if I have two people who use their, lose their job, I still have that, that third unit. The, the math that I work out on my, on my multis, typically one unit pays the mortgage. So even if I have only one third of the, the people paying rent in any particular building, um, I, I'm not out of pocket. So th that's A. B, um, we just lived through a, a, an 18 to 20 month period of time where our governor didn't didn't actually say don't pay the rent. However, it's what a lot of people heard, right? And and so um, we doubled down on making sure that uh, we did things with our tenants that ensured that we got paid. And so and what and what that meant for us was as people lost jobs, uh, the property manager and I sat down and talked with them about filing for unemployment. If they didn't know how or they didn't have a computer, we brought them into the office or we brought our laptop to them or we went to Starbucks with them and we walked them through the process. I can't tell you how many people I, I applied for unemployment for that were tenants in my buildings. Um, some of my tenants were, were business owners and so we helped them apply for the PPP so that they had income so that we could get paid. Um, we, we took a very hands-on approach with, uh, with our tenants. And again, with 70 rental units, um, it, it, was, it was a big project. And yet, during the lockdown period and the period of time that uh, till, till today that, that followed that, we were at 85 or almost 90% of, of uh, rent received than we should have. Uh, as soon as as soon as the Biden administration uh, released the whatever they released, whatever it was called in March, 
right? That Unite CT, the trickle down effect of what, he, what, what they did came to Connecticut as Unite CT. And so the few people that we did struggle with, uh, we, we worked as hard as we could with them to, to keep them afloat. And as they got further and further behind with paying partial rent, because some, some of them simply could only pay partial rent, we accepted that with some caveats. And then the Unite CT program came back and we went back and had them apply for back rent, forward rent, uh, electrical, you know. So there, there are programs in, in times of strife I, what I have experienced is that there are programs that if you are willing to learn about those programs and help your tenants work through some of those programs, their life is better and then your life is better because they're still paying the rent. So I, I, maybe that's not the, the, the answer you were looking for, but it, but it is my answer to that. I, I, if there's a meltdown coming, I'm sure there is a meltdown coming. And if it's, if it's a year from now or five years from now or 15 or 20 years from now, at some point, the market will shift. Um, part of the reason that I like real estate is that the values never go to zero and people always need some place to live, right? And so if, if in fact, some, like, everything goes to hell in a handbasket and all of a sudden there's a huge swath of people who are simply not paying, well, we also still do have the courts. I mean, we didn't have the courts during the pandemic, just, just as a reminder, right? Because, because you couldn't file evictions. There was an eviction moratorium for 19 months or something crazy like that. So, so I, just, I feel like we just lived through something that could have been disastrous and figured out a path through it. Um, I, I made money and, and kept buying, and I, I intend to, to keep doing that. I'm, I'm not afraid of the of the what if, because um, I think that there there are safety nets built in, and um, when you expect the market to shift and change, when it actually does, it comes as less as a surprise. Is, Is there a risk? Yeah, that's helpful. Is there? You mentioned in the beginning that there were some risks you were going to talk about. Is there a risk you think uh, we should the class should know about that you've thought about that you think is the biggest risk for you or for an investor? Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give one answer that'll make some people groan, but I'll give it anyway. I, frankly, I think the biggest risk that faces you as investors is not, not buying. That to me is the biggest risk, is, is, is sitting out, sitting on the sidelines. Um, past that, so, so that, that, that for some of you was groan worthy. And yet I do mean it, I, I, I think that the, there's so much opportunity right now um, to, set, to set yourselves up for that financial freedom that comes um, with scale that I think it would be a shame not to, um, uh, not to take advantage of that. Other, per, other risks, whether they're real or perceived, um, you know, to me, it's more, they're, they're more like situation scenario uh, specific. Um, I, 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 I don't buy things that, a lot of properties in the cities that I buy in are zoned for a two family, but they've been illegally converted to a three family, right? Or three families that they carved up the middle unit. And now there's, there's four families. Um, I, those to me are not worth the risk, right? When things come on and the rents look too good to be true, there's a reason that they look too good to be true. There's either an illegal unit in, in the building or the rents include heat. That's another thing I didn't mention that, that we, don't, we don't buy properties where the heat is included because we then have no control over, sometimes there's electric and heat, sometimes just heat. We have no control over that. And so I can't make plans about profits if new tenants can come in and keep it at you know, sauna levels. So we look past all of, uh, all of those. I don't take risks um, where the, the towns or the cities are involved. Um, because I, I don't ever want to be put in a position of, uh, of having to lie, uh, which I won't. I don't take risks with, uh, with financing. Um, I know people who tell the banks that they're going to live there and then they don't. Uh, I, you know, I don't take risks like that at all because I, I want to be able to always tell the truth and not have that stuff to come back to, uh, to bite me. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Joanne, you are muted, my dear. Do you stay strictly with legal 
units. And, yes. Okay. And then with that question, if it does have um, a basement rented out or whatever, do you use your just the two family numbers and still take still buy the property, rent out that third unit until whenever? No, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so, so illegal units um, create an enormous amount of exposure and liability. Uh, first and foremost, from an insurance perspective, if, if there's a fire in that house and that house burns down and the people in the, in the lower level unit that is an illegal um, rental die or are seriously maimed, guess what? You, you are screwed. Because Thank you're... You you, like you're you're insured you're you're not you're not insured for something that that isn't compliant um so so that that's problematic and then the towns and cities uh i've, I've had conversations with zoning enforcement officers who are like okay you know what if there's a if there's an illegal unit run in the opposite direction because they have monitored investors who have decided to buy them and at thinking that at some point I'll just fix it. When the tenants leave, I'll, I'll connect the two units again and make it just a three family again. But then they get addicted to the money with the extra unit and they don't do that, right? Selective amnesia creeps on in. You think, oh, I forgot that I was actually going to not do that and, and they keep it alive. And here's what happens. If there's a complaint filed by somebody who lives inside of a building with an illegal unit in many towns and cities, what happens is the city will come out they slap a violation on the on the landlord, and then the landlord is required to relocate the tenant that is living in the illegal unit into something that is uh, comparable. And the tenant in most towns and cities has a right to decide whether or not where you're going to put them is they feel is comparable. Which means a lot of a lot of uh, landlords who find themselves in that position get to put people up in hotels until they can find some place to put people and sometimes hotels for long periods of time i'm not interested in in, in those kinds of uh, of issues no it makes a lot of sense um what about like a, a lot of towns now are allowing accessory apartments so you can have it but there's no cooking or something such as that yeah see that that to me is going to be it's, it's going to be a it, the, the rent the, the the rent amounts there are going to be not worth the you know it, I guess the the real answer Joanne is is it depends off the top of my head that doesn't sound terribly appealing to me simply because if, if you can't cook in it who wants to live there which means what's the quality of tenant I may be attracting to live in that particular unit is the is the money really really valid to to help me create the the criteria of my thousand dollars a month minimum for a building. So the best thing is stay with it all legal. Uh, that that's that's my motto, and I don't. That's one I don't veer from. That's a criteria of mine that I do not veer from. Okay, um, there, there have been two or three opportunities in the last couple of weeks and months that have come my way that I thought, oh man, if I just squint and pretend, nope, just say no. Okay, just say I no. I appreciate sure your info, Thank Marcel. You. Um, what is your opinion about um, buying a condo versus a multifamily, a multifamily? Yeah, so great question. I do own I do own a couple of condos. I don't love condos versus multifamily simply because. Um, so first of all, a condo is typically one uh, one tenant, right? And as I said, I like the I like the safety net that I feel like multifamilies give me. Uh, if there's one paying person inside of the condo and they lose their job, well, then I, I don't have I don't have any anybody else contributing to help um, to help offset that that cost. Um, I find that the common charges for condos oftentimes skew the numbers in such a way that they that it, it's harder to make uh, the money that I want to make. Um, typically, I find that those those common charges. Uh, I, if I if I owned the the property and had to do the services myself, I could oftentimes do them for less than what the common charges are. But you can't do that in the condo because the common charges are your common charges. Um, I don't I don't love the idea of shared walls. Uh, 
I, I can't quite tell you why. I just I don't I don't love the idea of of shared walls in that I feel like I don't have as much control over uh, over my own of my own property. So th those are just kind of some personal uh, things. Condos can I do own uh, I own one in Casagmo in Ridgefield, one in Fox Hill in Ridgefield, and Debbie and I own a um, a corporate condo on Mill Plain Road in Danbury together. And so I do own some condos. Um, I just like the multifamilies better for for those reasons. Plus, it's a lot of rules. You got a lot of rules with a condo. I don't like to be told what to do, Marcel. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, it's 826. I'm happy to stay on for four more minutes if anybody else has a question that they want to throw my way. Going once. Yes, Gerardo. Let's see. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Oh, hi. Uh, quick question. Uh, what's your, do you have any experience with rooming? Or what's your take on um, rooming out your uh, units if you, if you are, if you do uh, take that route? Yeah. Oh, we, oh, no, no. we do email. not. Yeah. So I did hear, I did hear the question. Um, I, we do not rent by the room. Uh, we have looked at some opportunities where. What is multi complex? What? So multi. Okay, what is so so J Y N Y. I'm not sure who that is. I'm going to mute you for a second because I'm going to answer Gerardo's question. Um, so so you know, from renting out rooms, we don't do that from a, like a rooming house perspective. Um, yeah, it's a it's a personal opinion. Uh, I, it, it feels like the quality of the tenant starts to degrade um, a little bit more transient um, than than perhaps renting out uh, units. Um, yeah. Can it maximize the space that you have? Sure. Um, I'm not sure what the insurance implications are of that. I'm not sure people who are renting out by the room have informed their insurance companies that they're doing that because I'm, I'm certain that the insurance companies have a different take on that, whether if there's additional people in there. So I, I don't have a great answer for that. I don't have much experience. I will tell you that we shy away from it. Um, where we, we kind of try and stick in, in in that one lane and go with that one lane. Plus, I think my property managers would would strangle me if uh, you know. It, as it is, every one of my building units is three rental management units. If each if each one of those if each of those was a three bedroom and now the one building turned into nine management units, um, I may have a mutiny on my hand from the perspective of of property management. I hope that answers that. Um, and I yes, think thank you. You're welcome. JYNY, I don't know your name, but JYNY, tell me, tell me your question. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I actually hit the mute button by accident, but I have a quick question. If if I'm interested in buying like an apartment complex, is that feasible for your first investment property? Because you mentioned like to have a safety net. And that's like, you know, a, a big safety net with you know a bunch of different properties all at one time. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, the, the apartment complexes, we've started to look as the uh, as the multifamily uh, market got tighter, we started to look out and say, okay, well, what about a six unit apartment complex or a 12 unit apartment complex? You'll spend, depending on where you buy it, you'll spend more. Um, as long as the numbers work, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a bad investment. Uh, again, we haven't ever purchased one. Um, I, I do know people who, who have owned and do own Kind of apartment uh, apartment buildings uh, in in that vein. Uh, the only thing to remember there is that oftentimes you're you're looking at where, whereas we have property managers um, with an apartment building, you may you may need to have some version of like a super or a handyman um, sometimes on site, depending on the site on the size. Sometimes close enough um, uh, and on call that uh, to to handle that because apartment style living is just a little bit different than. Uh, than multifamily living, which is different again than condo living. So, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a bad path if the numbers work. Uh, my answer is almost always if the numbers work, um, go for it. I don't, I don't think there's, there's necessarily downsides to an apartment building per se. Gotcha. And, and one other question is, is, is um, the path to, you know, like different FHA loans and is there any specific loans that, that will accommodate the purchase of, you know, of apartment complex? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Karen has her information in the chat. I'm gonna ask you to connect with her on that. Um, okay. It, it may be more of a commercial loan, but Karen can kind of point you in that direction to uh, to guide you either um, either through her or through um, through a, um, a sister company of hers that um, that might be able to help on that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate sure it. Sure thing. No worries, guys. This was a real pleasure. I hope that uh, I hope that you took away what you wanted to take away. Um, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, um, longer than than we expected. Again, I hope this was was helpful. If you have additional questions, the first path I would point you to is um, if you're a guest of ours tonight, talk to your agent, right? Your agent was here hearing the same information. They do this for a living. So so find them and ask them the questions, ask them uh, about getting started. Uh, if I can be a resource to uh, to them for you, I'm happy to uh, to be that on the uh, on the back end. And I wish you all a very prosperous 2022. My, I, I leave you with these words. Um, go like figure out, figure out how to go and buy, uh, buy your first property or your next property. Uh, I, I challenge you to, uh, to do that because it's, it is, a, it is, the, you, you will not, you will not, you'll regret more not taking action today then you will taking any action today, even if it's not 100% the right action. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to buy the wrong one. The good news is it's still real estate. If you buy the wrong one and you hate it, well, turn around and sell it and go buy something else, right? It's not the end of the planet. None of this stuff is the end of the planet. So, so take the perspective of, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to fail forward if if uh, if if uh, if I if if that shows up. And my hope is that you take some of what we talked about tonight to minimize that failing forward. Just 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 get started in in whatever way you can, even if that's taking steps today to start saving the money or or cleaning up your credit or doing something where where you're doing it a year from now. But you have to start today, pointing in that direction. Have a great evening. We'll see some of you tomorrow, and we'll see the rest of you as soon as. Uh, as soon as we can. We hope to get back into the classroom soon enough and we'll have a, a 201. This was more of a 101 session. We'll have a 201 soon in person. Thanks guys. Have a great night. Thanks, Thank Rick. You. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much, Rick. Have a good night. See you in the morning. And Rick, what's happening on Friday? I don't think he heard.